Hi, I'm Hannah Dallas. I am the Southern Windsor County Forester. So I cover um, half county from uh, Bridgewater, Woodstock, Heartland down to um, the Wyndham border. And uh, I've been in this position for about a year and a half. Thanks, Hannah. David or Linda, do you wanna say hi, say where you're from and uh, what interested you in the chat today? I can say hi. 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 My name's Linda Ladove and I'm dialing in from Colorado. Um, I can tell you announcements. I'm on the FW Facebook page and my husband is an alum of F and W, grew up going to the camp and worked at the camp and we have lots of lots of ties to the to F and W. So um, and I work for a nonprofit in Colorado that's focused on statewide land conservation. And um, I'm here as a fly on the wall really. I'm interested in seeing what you do for this webinar and we're interested in doing some broader educational outreach across the state to the public um, through webinars about conservation in general. We serve land trusts primarily and um, open space agencies and conservation professionals involved in conservation easements and that sort of thing. So I'm, I'm here just to sort of see how you all um, do this and uh, learn from you. Great, well, welcome. Thanks for joining us. So I'm uh, David Hoffer. I uh, live in Hanover, New Hampshire. Uh, I work for uh, an organization called the Lime Timber Company, um, which is in the timberland investment management business, though I'm not trained as a forester. I spend a lot of time around foresters. Um, and uh, I'm also an F&W alum. I went to Timber Lake with Phil back about uh, 40 years ago, frighteningly enough. Crazy. Um, and uh, spent about 25 years on the board of what was originally the Wilderness Corporation and then became the Nineveh Foundation, uh, and so was involved in a number of conservation initiatives uh, in and around Lake Nineveh. My family has had a, uh, a cabin as part of the wilderness community just down the road from Saltash Mountain Camp um, that I first got to camp on in uh, 1968. So. Uh, Glad to see that uh, all sorts of good conservation work continues at Nanva Foundation. Hey, thanks, David. Um, oh, I see Jay just joined us. Great. Um, I can introduce myself. I'm Kelly Bierman. I'm conservation director for both Farm and Wilderness and Nanva Foundation. Um, I live in Vermont um, and for almost a, a decade now, originally from Pennsylvania, and I have a background. Um, in environmental studies, forestry, uh, environmental education, um, and I've been in the conservation director role for a little over a year now. Um, and primarily, um, I, there's a lot of things involved with the role and I'm still learning about it, but so primarily I work with our forester stylists, our logger, other staff members to make sure we're um, on track with our stewardship plans um, and activities, community engagement, uh, we do some uh, lake stewardship, um, aquatic invasive species um, prevention programming, um, and if and we do, of course, as you know, camp. So unfortunately, no summer camp this year, but we're going to do a teen conservation program at um, Tamarack Farm um, as well this year. So a little sad that's not happening, but next year it will happen. Um, so it's a little bit about me. Jay, hi. <laughs> We were just, uh, since we're a small group, we were just going around introducing ourselves. Did you want to jump in? Sure. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Jay Coleman. I'm the interim executive director here, and normally I'm the director of sustainable resources at Farm and Wilderness. I've been here for quite a while, and uh, it's nice to see you all. Great. All right. So um, let's jump right in. Um, and because it, we're a small group today, um, again, you all know like to stay on mute when you're, um, when you're not the asking a question or anything, but because we're a small group, if you do have a question at any time, feel free to uh, unmute. I'm not going to have a specific time 
um, where I stop and um, ask questions. If you have a question and you want to put it in the chat box, feel free, but it's a small group. I feel like we can manage ourselves pretty well um, on Zoom today. Um, so I just wanted to briefly just kind of give an overview um, of what our chat, our goals, we did our introduction. Um, and really the main purpose of this is um, to provide a little bit of education around um, who Farm and Wilderness and Nineveh Foundation is, what they do, um, why, um, why they're charged with um, conservation, and uh, a little bit about our properties, um, and a little bit of summary about our stewardship plans um, and how we manage our lands. And it's meant to be like a broad um, educational tool for everyone to learn a little bit about the organization. And then Hannah's here today too to provide some um, some education around Vermont statewide forest stewardship and just some perspective from her role. Um, and so this is the first of our conservation chats and we hope to do these more in the future on various topics. And they're meant to be, you know, just accessible and for folks to ask questions and learn more about what we do at Farm and Wilderness and Nineveh Foundation. I um, already mentioned the chat will be recorded um, and we're already going on that. All right, so First, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, Farm and Wilderness and Nineveh Foundation, although this group is pretty knowledgeable <laughs> already, so you don't need to go through all that history. Um, but so I'll focus on the recent affiliation. So in 2018, um, Farm and Wilderness and Nineveh Foundation um, became affiliated organizations, primarily because of their shared history um, since the 1960s when Wilderness Corporation was now a Nineveh Foundation um, started. Um, and there's just the primary reason for the affiliation. I mean, there's many, but there's a common thread of environmental uh, stewardship, conservation, and the missions of both organizations. And um, through the affiliation, it seemed like there'd be a stronger uh, way to work together um, on that piece of the mission. And so what that really means is there's still separate organizations um, still have the separate land holdings, um, but we're managed by the same staff and same board of trustees. Um, Jay, since you're here, do you have anything to add about that? You good? <laughs> I think I think you captured it pretty well, Kelly. Okay. Kelly, can I just add one historical note? Sorry of to, course. to jump in. You um, should. That um, the Nineveh Foundation actually is the entity that is the successor to the Wilderness Corporation. Um, which was founded back in 1961 or 62. So there was a, a legal conversion that took place for tax purposes in 1995, but really the, um, the work and the efforts and the land holding of the Nineveh Foundation extends back to the early 60s, not quite as old as F&W, but uh, it was, as you said, a long shared history. Yes, thank you for that. Yeah, there's a little snippet on the Nineveh Foundation website about that, and then I've just recently um, read um, was the Green Book, which is like Ken Webb's um, archives of how um, the Wilderness Corporation started, um, which is a pretty interesting uh, read. Um, so just wanted to give an overview of the, the land, the conserved land that each of the organization um, care for. Um, and then we'll look at some maps together. Um, so in total, um, we're over 4,000 acres combined with both organizations. Um, Farmer Wilderness has in total a little over a thousand, most of which um, are under forest legacy easement and a 766 acres are enrolled in the uh, UVA or current use program. Um, all of which are in Plymouth and the primary water body um, around it is Woodward Reservoir. And then Nineveh Foundation close by in Plymouth and in Mount Holly um, holds 3,129 acres, um, most of which again are under forest legacy easement. Um, and then, and also most are in the, um, the current use program and both in Mount Holly and uh, town of Plymouth and the primary water body there is uh, Lake Nineveh. Um, so let me admit this person, great. Um, and then I just wanted to um, 
give it over to, to Hannah if she has anything to add about um, current use or Forest Legacy to add any more information there about those programs and how they work statewide. Sure. So I, um, I was telling Kelly just before we started, I'm still learning about the different pieces, even though I work for the state of Vermont and uh, manage the current use program, I am um, mostly managing enrollments in the um, productive forest current use program. So land that um, is 25 acres and greater, um, which these fit in, uh, and then landowners um, enroll in the program and they get a, a substantial tax break for committing to um, sustainable forest management and um, timber harvesting and, and work like that. So the forest legacy program overlaps that and is more of a federal, um, it works with states, but it's, uh, it's a federal program for properties that have um, that significant and um, it's, a, it's essentially a state held uh, easement. So there's lots of other land trusts and easements um, across Vermont, but this one is kind of held within the state of Vermont and overseen by the state of Vermont. So they're, um, they work together and like current use and force legacy work together, but they're also still separate programs. Um, and then there's also, I don't know if you want to get into it too much, but there's also a conservation um, current use UVA uh, category. So there's um, properties that are eligible that, um, sorry, I'm getting up. Like, it's hard to keep them separate when I'm like looking at a paper and reading them, but reciting it's a little difficult, but they are um, prop or landowners that qualify for um, not as a nonprofit can enroll in the conservation current use, which has kind of a separate set of rules and um, forest management and harvesting becomes kind of a secondary or a, um, less of less in the forefront of the objectives for the program. Is that, Kelly, I, I'm stumbling a little bit, but is that? That's great. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, it's, they're kind of complicated. They're all kind of interwoven together. You can, um, be in conservation UVA and forest legacy or productive forest UVA and legacy or just um, UVA. And lots and lots of landowners across the state of Vermont are just in um, productive forest uh, UVA. So. Yeah, it is like, and I'm learning the same thing and I'm learning every day about those programs and um, it is complex and I would say that um, both between both organizations we have at least you know we have forest legacy and we do have I believe at least two different we have the conservation um, current use and I believe um, non-conservation because Nineveh is a qualified conservation um, organization and pieces of farming wilderness are as well but not all of it um, and so um, and so they and they do overlap on um, on our lands and so like making a map of all the ways those programs overlap and on all the acres has been a little bit of a challenge but I think I'm uh, figuring it out. Um, are there any questions about those programs or how they relate to farmer wilderness or Nineveh? I, I just had a, a quick question um, that I'm curious about the difference between the productive forest program and the conservation current use program in terms of restrictions and uh, ability to um, to be removed from those programs. My understanding is that really the forest legacy program is sort of in a different category. Sorry about the background. Um, because the forest legacy uh, easement is a conservation easement that was sold on a one-time basis and represents a permanent encumbrance on the land and uh, restricts those properties forevermore. Um, but the current use pro programs, um, you could, you can remove land from them, 
my recollection is there may be some difference in the rules between current use, the, the conservation current use and the productive forest. So can you clarify or remind me? Yeah, I mean, I know, I know a little bit um, about this and Hannah, maybe you know a little more, but it's kind of like a lean. So like you can, you can enroll and then there is a penalty for, um, for coming out of, um, out of the program. Um, and I don't know if there's certain um, changes like in ownership or other things that alleviate you from that um, penalty. Um, Hannah, do you have any other things about that? Um, I know the details as far as um, enrolling or unenrolling in, in the productive force current use. I actually don't oversee the, um, the conservation current use enrollments. So um, my, my supervisor, Keith Thompson, oversees those. So I am not uh, as well versed in the, the kind of regulations associated with the conservation current use. I would have to look up in our, our handbook and kind of do a little bit more research on it. So I'm happy to get back to you if you if you'd like, but I just don't know it off the top of my head. I'm also fairly new, so um, I'm still learning as I go. Yeah, Jay, do you have any insight onto that? Because I know you know a little bit about what we've done um, for both organizations and what the um, penalties or restrictions might be and the difference between conservation UVA and um, the one thing that I know in, into David's point about, you know, the, the forest legacy easement's a one-time payment for the extinguishing of development rights, generally. Um, in the UVA, as you stay enrolled, that uh, provides um, year-after-year tax benefits or deductions. And I don't think the, there's any difference in the tax benefit, whether you're in uh, conservation current use or the regular UVA program. Yeah, that's correct. The, the benefits are the same um but the kind of goals of the the program are, are slightly different i have to just uh let my dog in i'll be right back okay um and while hannah's doing that we'll uh we'll take a look at some maps um so i'm gonna stop sharing that screen and start sharing another screen Let me move some things over before I start sharing. Okay. All right, share screen two. All right, so um these maps probably look a little familiar to some of you, but I just wanted to show um, show folks this because it kind of gives the scope of um, the land holdings both organizations have, where they are in relationship to each other, um, and where they are located in Plymouth and Mount Holly. So in green here, here's the main or what we sometimes nickname this um, parcel um, up around Lake um, or Woodward Reservoir here. Um, the, the Woodward or lower <laughs> uh, camp area of Farm and Wilderness. And um, the reason we say that is because Farm and Wilderness does rent some um, land in, from Nineveh Foundation. Um, and so we call those the Nineveh camps. So, um, but Farm and Wilderness does own these other two um, green parcels up here that are contiguous to Nineveh property as well. So that, um, and then this, uh, property around Plymouth uh, or Woodward Reservoir, about 444 acres of that um, is Forest Legacy. And I don't have it um, marked on here, but if you follow the line from the ridge line down to almost like the road, that's pretty much the, the boundary for the um, for Forest Legacy. And all of these two parcels here, the Farm and Wilderness, owns is under forest legacy easement um, and eventually will be put into uh, conservation current use. Um, and then Nineveh is a little bit more complicated <laughs> because there is more of it. So um, I'm currently working on um, mapping out the different parcels that are in current use, um, conservation current use, and have a forest legacy um, easement 
on them. But that just gives you a sense of place of where these uh, land holdings are and, um, and their relationship to each other um, of the two organizations that work together. Um, and because forest stewardship isn't um, about just within the boundaries of the, um, of the land holding or the property, um, I have this map here. The David, you might be very familiar with this map. <laughs> Um, this just so shows the properties that we just looked at. You can see, um, I don't know if you can see my cursor here, but here's the F&W on Woodward Reservoir, two parcels here, and then all of Nineveh, and it's part of this um, Bear Corridor. Um, it was a project started, I think, back in the 90s with all these different partners, Forest Legacy, the State Conservation Fund, um, to preserve and protect um, areas that help form a wildlife corridor, particularly for bears, um, to navigate. And as you can see, those parcels are a pretty big chunk of that um, project and do make a lot of connections with these other parcels here. Um, so it's just really cool to see property um, being part of a larger ecological um, uh, project. Um, let me stop sharing those maps. Any questions about those properties and where they are? And Okay, I'm sharing my screen again. Sorry. Just make sure it's sharing. There we go. All right, so that's just a little bit of an introduction. Did the maps. Um, so this next slide is just kind of an interesting, um, just an interesting concept. I get this question kind of a lot about what the difference between conservation and stewardship is. And, you know, it's semantics, but like for me, from my perspective, I have, um, I have some, um, opinions about it, and Hannah might have some opinions, Jay might have some opinions. Um, and so when people ask me that question, um, to me, conservation is kind of like the overall framework that you put around, um, they put around a parcel or a piece of land, um, and that framework creates the goals um, for what you want to do with that land, for how it's going to be used. And stewardship is more of, um, more of the action, the practices that you um, put into place the plan you put into place to support the conservation framework. Um, so for me and my perspective, when I'm thinking about it in my conservation director role, this, those kind of, I sometimes make those distinctions depending on the, the context. Um, and, but on broad scale, like conservation stewardship really just mean the same thing, which is like wise use of natural resources in a sustainable way. Um, so, um, and best so that they can be used in the future um, for a variety of um, uses. Um, but I'm just curious to know if anybody else has run into that kind of, you know, distinction or if they use those words interchangeably, because um, we are going to be talking about forest stewardship um, a little bit. I, I hadn't seen it laid out that way, but I think that makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's something that like I never really thought about before, but it, it's starting to come up a lot more <laughs> and how people use um, use those two different words interchangeably to mean the same thing and sometimes um, different things. So with that, so we're here to talk about forest stewardship. What is it? So there's, you know, I always put out the, um, the cited definition of the thing we're talking about. Um, and I think like, those of us here pretty much have a good sense of what it means. So, um, and you know, Penn State lays out, I have, a, I think the pretty good definition of it includes, um, you know, the wise use, making sure it's sustainable for a lot of different uses um, and that all the components are being thought about broadly, including non-living and living components. Um, and that understanding that forests play a larger role globally, um, environmentally. So. Um, but at the basic level, forest stewardship is the wise use and management and use of our forests to ensure the health and 
productivity for years to come. Um, so, and I think this group is pretty, pretty well versed in that concept. Um, and so when we think about that, and in my role, a lot of the things that I've been thinking about over the you know, past year or so, um, what does that really, what does that really mean? And there are a lot of things that go into that. And this is not an exhaustive list. Um, and they're all connected, which is a really um, interesting thing. So when you're a landowner and you're a large landowner or um, manager, um, similar to Farm and Wilderness and Nineveh, um, these are all the things that we think about um, when we're talking about managing land um, and in our stewardship plan. So when I work with our forester, our logger, with other staff, with, um, with invasive species professionals, herbicide applicators, um, these are all things when I work with camp, when I work with the community, these are all things that, um, that we think about and that go into those conversations, some more than others. Um, and, um, and I don't know if there's anything here, Hannah, that um, this is probably a broad list, but is there anything here, Hannah, that's missing or that you feel like um, it would also be good to mention when you're thinking about forest stewardship as a landowner or manager or really anybody who's wanting to um, participate in stewardship and planning? I think um, it comes down to some, some landowner goals. And so you might have, um, you might kind of choose when I work with people that are in current use, like they are looking at forest stewardship and they're trying to be aware of all these things, but then they might um, kind of focus more heavily on one based on landowner goals or the property that they happen to own or, or something like that. So just the only thing I would um, emphasize is it's a, a really great idea to be aware and kind of have all these things like kind of on your radar, but you may choose for your individual property to focus on some more than others. Yeah, that's a really great because if you're trying to think of all these on the same level or prioritize all these on the same level, um, you're probably not gonna achieve <laughs> uh, the goals that you set out for. Um, but, um, but we certainly still like, when you're thinking about invasive species management, you think about everything that goes into that, including soil and water quality, if you're going to be applying herbicide and things like that. So, so there's a lot of sub uh, elements to all these elements. And when you work through your plan, they usually come with it. So um, I would agree that as a, as a landowner or somebody who's um, uh, stewarding um, or caring for land, that it doesn't work well when you try to think of all these at the same or prioritize them all at the same level. And also thinking like um, that you can't, it's really great to be aware of everything, but you may not be able to do everything. Like it just may not be possible. If you want to um, encourage a certain wildlife species, you may lose out on one of these other aspects. You may not be able to have recreation in that area if you're trying to encourage um, certain wildlife in in that same area. And so you, there may be trade-offs and that's where your kind of goals come in and, and um, also looking at where you are in the landscape and what's around you and what other properties may serve, serve the purposes um, of some of your goals. Yeah, and that's why it's um, really good um, to have a plan, um, which Nineveh and Farm and Wilderness do. Um, and so I just wanted to give an example of what's kind of an outline of what um, is in our plans. And both of our plans for both organizations are um, pretty much identical, except for the fact of that, that there's the property itself is different. So whenever there's certain elements or natural features that are different that that's noted in the plan, but how it's structured, a lot of the same goals. Um, our forester manages or helps me manage both of those um, plans. So, um, so I took, because of that, I took out just a snippet of 
the vision statement and goals from the Farm and Wilderness Plan. The Nineveh Plan is very similar in, in the vision statement um, and goals. Um, and so this, I think, summarize, summarizes the goals for Farm and Wilderness um, pretty well. So we still want it to be a working productive forest. We do, both Nineveh and Farm and Wilderness, receive a little bit of income um, from timber harvest, and that's to help pay for um, property taxes and further conservation um, and stewardship work. Um, so that is part of and one of our goals um, that may be less so for other people um, or other landowners. Um, and then we do prioritize wildlife habitat, soil and water quality, um, recreation, and um, in the vision also, especially for farm and wilderness, we've built in education, especially supporting our, um, uh, the youth that come to our summer camp um, and using our land to provide that um, education. Um, and that sets up, that vision and those goals set up that awareness that Hannah was talking about. So it helps you, guide you through all those, those different elements um, and keeping you on track with your specific priorities um, for how you want to use your land. So we have the vision and goals. We have um, descriptions of all the parcels, so the acreage, um, the fact that it's um, mostly northern hardwood, um, the density, um, the different stands, um, the history of the parcel. So it's really good to understand that, you know, 60 years ago, um, this young forest was actually agricultural land because it really informs you about what's there, why it's there, and if you want to um, at some point in the future um, manage the forest so that different different trees or different plants or different um, wildlife areas um, are being created. Um, because a lot of time what that happens with agricultural land is that you get a young forest and it's um, sometimes a lot of the same trees and you want to diversify your um, your forest and encourage certain trees and certain species to grow. Um, so there's a description um, and history for both organizations in there. And then also the big thing and the thing that takes up I think a lot a large chunk of each document are our stewardship practices. So this those practices really inform and go back to the goals. Um, and the practices for both organizations are really the, this list, the forest management, wildlife habitat, recreation and aesthetics, um, cultural and historic resources, and ecosystem management. And just to give you, there's a lot of different practices underneath these subheadings. So I can give you an example um, for um, each one. So an example for forest management would be we have um, specific buffet, buffer or protection areas around um, spots on our property that we need to pay attention to if we are doing any forest management. And they, they're listed out um, riparian zones, um, maybe 150 foot buffer that we need to keep one, be aware of when we're um, doing any kind of forest management. So that's just one aspect um, that's under forest management. Wildlife habitat, um, you know, we have guidelines for block size and connectivity so that we're aware of when we are doing forest management or when, whatever we're using our um, property for, that we're making sure there's connectivity between wildlife um, areas and that we are creating um, a diverse um, landscape for wildlife. So we do have some openings as well as um, the forest because there is wildlife that appreciate openings and edge habitat um, as well. But those are very um, intentional and they're very prescribed and they're only within a certain size. So our stewardship plan out, outlines that. Um, recreation and aesthetics. So there's guidelines for trail maintenance um, and how trails should be marked and where they should go in accordance to um, the um, restrictions of forest legacy easement. Um, and also some, there are some, maybe perhaps some current guide, uh, use guidelines, but we usually default to forest legacy because those are generally more um, generally more strict um, and that overall we it's just um, non-commercial non-motorized use recreation use of um, our property especially the forest legacy um, easements because that is built into the easement um, and we we have 
being in New England, we have farmsteads, stone walls, cellar holes as cultural and historic resources on our property. So in our stewardship plan, we have specific um, guidance on if we're doing forest management or any other activity around those resources that we need to create a buffer or um, if damage uh, happens to any of them that there is um, an active plan to replace or repair those historic resources. Um, and then ecosystem management, um, we have um, some guidelines in there about recognizing um, how our property fits into the larger ecosystem of Vermont. You know, the Bear Corridor map I just um, showed you, um, forest stewardship doesn't exist in just those property boundaries. And so we have some guidelines in there for us to make sure that we're aware of, um, that we're not just living in those boundaries when we're um, managing our property, but we're also looking outside of those boundaries, interacting with our neighbors, making sure that um, we don't just live in a, in a bubble <laughs> um, when we do our management. Um, and then we have some guidelines on monitoring. So how are we gonna monitor um, our plan and how we're doing with our plan? And part of that is, uh, one of those is um, talking with our county forester, like Anna, to come out and do inspections um, whenever um, they are required. Um, and then making sure that we are reviewing um, and we're coming up on our 10 year update for our um, stewardship plans too. Um, so those are built in there. And then management prescriptions. And this, this makes up half of the, <laughs> the plan. I think it's, it's like a 60 page document. And these prescriptions are just very detailed um, information about each forest stand. Um, and um, so anything from acreage type, species of trees, density or stocking, basal area, soils, wildlife habitat, management objectives for each of our, um, our stands. And for F and W, I'll give you an example of that parcel that's around Woodward Reservoir, there are about seven stands. But for Nineveh, I can't even, I, I'd have to count them. There are many, <laughs> many stands. And stands can be, you know, anywhere from uh, a few acres to, you know, Farm and Wilderness has one as high as 80, and it just depends um, on how those stands are formed, um, defined by the species in the, in the area. Um, so that's just kind of a review and summary of what we have as organizations and large landowners in our stewardship plan and what we look at and what we review um, each year ongoing as we're doing our management. Does anybody have any questions about um, that overview? Yeah, Jay. You're mute. I'm just so slightly off topic, but I, I know Hannah's here, and I'm just wondering, like, how our sort of forest um, management plans sort of align with the state stewardship plans? Like, are the goals pretty similar? And, and Kelly or Hannah, either, um, please jump in on that. I'm just curious if we're if we're competing in different ways, or they 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 make sense together. I just question. I have no idea about. Yeah. So. The current use program has um, a set of standards that we require. Most of it is um, based around like forest metrics. So um, looking at basal area, um, for, and uh, sorry, the, just to back up, the current use program is very stand based. So each stand needs um, to have the standards met. Um, and so they're, they're looked at kind of um, individually slightly. Um, and yeah, there's standards, it's basal area, species composition, um, kind of age of the forest, whether you're looking to do uneven age management or even age management. Um, and so there, yeah, there's a long list um, of, of standards and then Anything that is on top of those standards, we certainly look at, and it's great information, but it's not uh, necessary to the current use program. So I wouldn't say that they're competing in any way unless um, 
unless, for example, you have a goal that competes with the, the current use program for some reason. Like if, if you don't want to harvest ever, that would um, directly compete with the goal of the current use program or the, the productive current use, pro um, sorry, productive forest land in current use um, because the goal of not harvesting isn't, doesn't fit with that program. Um, and I, sh I should have asked a little bit more um, pointedly because I was looking at the farm and wilderness land in the state land, like on the spine of the green mountains. And I wonder if there's like a holistic view of what that should look like of public and private lands. Oh, sure. Um, I know that when the, so that, that work on the state lands is um, done by the state lands forester, foresters and stewardship foresters, um, which is a separate slightly separate um, area of the forest parks and recreation. So I um, focus on the, the private land enrolled in the current use program, but the stewardship foresters, when they're writing management plans for that state land, they are looking holistically at um, the, the parcel and then outside of that parcel and goals um, and working with fish and wildlife and um, looking at wildlife on those parcels and, and corridors and things like that. So, um, does that, does that kind of answer your question? Thank you. Yeah. Um, that is all um, I had um, to kind of go over and give you more of a specific example using um, farm and wilderness in Nineveh um, to give a review of our stewardship plans. Um, but I wanted to give Hannah some time because I sent her some questions um, that she um, thought about and would, wants to give some answers on. And then we'll, you know, if we have time left over, we can have some, um, if you all have any questions, uh, we can talk about them. Sure. So I'll go <clears throat> to the first question that Kelly had sent. Um, and she had asked, how does my role as county forester or the role of county foresters um, support forest stewardship and conservation practices for the state of Vermont? Um, and so let me just look over my notes and then I'll, I'll try to answer that. So yeah, so the, the um, county forester role is, um, has a long history and is kind of ever evolving. Um, and the, the kind of, yeah, main goal that we've talked about is to oversee parcels that are enrolled in current use. And so there is a lot of um, work associated with that. I have 1300 parcels that I oversee in half a county. Um, there are some counties with more and some counties with less, but it takes up a big chunk of my time just kind of doing the um, administrative pieces of that and um, and kind of checking up on parcels to make sure they're doing what they're supposed to and reviewing management plans. But the basis for the current use program is um, kind of sustainable forest management and forest stewardship. Um, and so we are looking in all parcels managed in current use, we're looking for those parcels to be managed based on um, sound silviculture and uh, silvicultural guides. And so there's lots of different types of management that can happen, but we're basing all of that on kind of science and sustainability. And so the, yeah, the basis for the current use program is kind of forest stewardship and um, good management of properties. Um, there is kind of a wide variety of what good management looks like and, um, and what is allowable in the current use program. But part of my job is also meeting with landowners and talking to them about their goals and how they can maybe meet their goals and working with a, um, so they, all of these properties um, hire a consulting forester to write a management plan for them. And so talking to landowners about how they might hire a forester that can help them meet their goals and, um, and then eventually implementing it. And so part of implementing it is maintaining um, 
AMPs, so acceptable management practices, which are um, the, the state of Vermont's water quality guidelines. So all parcels enrolled in current use have to adhere to these uh, AMPs and, and follow them. So that's another piece of like for stewardship, making sure that everybody is following these guidelines um, and implementing them, um, maintaining water quality. And then there's kind of beyond that, there are a lot of landowners that are just more interested in going a little bit above and beyond. And so I'm here as a resource for those landowners to help them um, kind of learn more about their forests, learn more about the, um, the landscape around them and, and help them, yeah, help them manage their forests in the way that they, they want to in a sustainable manner. Um, let me just go back and, oh yeah, so also um, I work a lot on um, educating landowners either one-on-one -on -one or in um, kind of formal talks about invasives. So that's another aspect of kind of forest stewardship and supporting that. Um, you, <clears throat> excuse me, you can't, um, you can't manage your current use parcel um, with blinders on to invasive. So um, we don't have specific guidelines on when you have to manage invasives on your property in current use, but we are constantly discussing it with landowners and um, making sure that properties stay forested. So if there's a sea of invasives and they're looking to do a harvest, they also need to be somehow incorporating um, invasive management into that property. So I, I find that, yeah, talking about invasive species, uh, mostly invasive plants, but also invasive pests like emerald borer is a big part of my job um, in educating landowners also. Does anybody have any, yeah, questions? Yeah, I was just wondering, um, so I was listening to you, Hannah, and then Kelly, I was thinking about what you had said before. You're both working together um, on F&W and w Nineveh lands, Nineveh lands, and I'm just thinking, Kelly, like, has your thinking around stewardship activities changed at all over the last six months to a year? Um, I think that um, when we were talking earlier and we were showing all the different elements of um, forest stewardship, and I think I've really realized what Hannah spoke to is that you can't, you can't do everything. And there's also trade-offs um, that you have to consider um, when you're thinking holistically about your property um, and the goals that you've you've set, so um, so I think you know in my in my role here that I've really learned that you just can't can't always <laughs> do everything, especially if you're you know a few people or one person and you and you have like acres and acres of property um, to to oversee. You just can't see everything for one thing all the time. Um, and so to expect that as a landowner or a land manager um, is unrealistic. So I've learned that a little bit about um, in this role and um, about being um, uh, participating in forest stewardship and interacting with our plan um, and learning from Anna and Silas, our forester, about things that are within your control, not within your control, um, and how to prioritize those. I have a question here from Colorado um, with a similar um, add on to Jay's question in terms of how you might have changed things in the last six months. If you've adapted any of your practices given COVID with monitoring properties and meeting with landowners and um, if you're doing any of that remotely or if you've changed any of those practices at all. So my, yeah, my world changed a lot. I have a two-year-old um, and so that has just changed. I'm home more. She actually went back to daycare today um, and it's been about what, four months. So um, yeah, I haven't been out on properties actually um, for a while. At first we had um, direction that we were not allowed to go out 
um, based on the stay at home order issued by our governor. Um, and then once that was lifted and we were able to go out, I have had a hard time getting out just because I'm with a two year old and, and trying to um, balance both. And so um, I am really eager to get back out on properties, um, but still it's not going to be with landowners very much. We are still following lots of social distancing um, and I find even when um, I've gone on a few inspections and, and site visits with landowners, even when I do that, it is difficult to do um, with a mask on and staying six feet away and trying to have um, a productive conversation with them in there while walking in their woods. Um, it's doable, but it's not quite the same. So for now, I, there are lots of properties in current use that are um, either there's no landowner that lives on the property or they are more of an absentee landowner. Um, and so there are plenty of properties that I can go out and do inspections on without the landowner. And that's part of my job is every 10 years, um, all the properties get inspected. So inspecting those without the landowner, um, it's not my favorite part of the job. I mean, it's a nice walk in the woods, but it's not um, kind of connecting and, and working directly with landowners, which is what I really, really value about my job. Um, but it still needs to get done. So that's possible for me to do with COVID. Um, and then, yeah, as soon as I can safely, I, I am eager to get out with landowners and meet with them. But for now, Zoom, Zoom chats are um, a good way to connect with people and, and still talk to them. It's different, you know, it's, it's not ideal, but we're making the best of it and trying to do the pieces of the position that um, are still required and still that work is still there. So, uh, it's, um, it's a challenge, you know, it's different. It's definitely shaking things up. Yeah, I found that too. I mean, I don't, I'm working uh, here at the office, um, but I find that even though I have, in theory, have more time to get outside and onto property, especially with camp um, not happening this year, um, in reality, because a lot of other things are online or um, that I'm pulled more <laughs> into the office um, for a lot of different things. And then a lot of the community engagement items that we were um, or events that we're going to be doing this summer were put on hold and we're just kind of reevaluating like when it might be appropriate for us as organizations to host something um, in, uh, in person, even if it's outdoors um, or if it's a hike. Um, so I think we're wrestling with that and trying to figure, figure that out uh, more. But I can relate to what Hannah was saying about not being able to interact with people on the land and doing stewardship activity or discussing it with the other people. I would just add also, um, I think that there are more landowners though that are um, connecting with their properties. And that's really cool for me to see as kind of, um, I'm always encouraging people to get out on their properties and um, kind of think about their land ethic and, and their stewardship of their property. Um, and it's, it's just, it's difficult to do that if you don't have a connection with it. And if you don't get out there and you don't um, see why you value it. So it's encouraging to see that a lot of landowners are getting outside um, and they're going either on their property or on other hikes in the state. And um, yeah, there's been a huge, huge uptick in use of state parks and um, town forests and swimming holes and things like that, which is just, um, you know, it's, I don't have a, a direct role in that, but it's inspiring to see that people are connecting with their land.
Yeah, that's really, that's really great. I've been seeing that too. Um, are there any other, I'm recognizing it's almost two, but if anybody has any other questions, I know that I had um, some other questions I gave to Hannah. So if nobody has any other questions, she could pick one of those um, if she wanted, or we could wrap up. Any other questions? Not so much of a question, but I just wanted to thank you, Kelly and, uh, and Jay for uh, all of your hard work and carrying on the, the conservation and stewardship activities of, uh, of Farm Wilderness and Minima Foundation. I think it's, it's an extraordinary land base and an extraordinary opportunity that uh, these organizations have managed to carve out over the past number of decades in this very busy and increasingly populated area of uh, Vermont. So this is uh, critical work that uh, that you're doing. I think the whole FNW and Nineveh communities are the better for it and uh, and uh, grateful also to Hannah for doing this on a larger scale in Windsor County and uh, I, I just think it's terrific. So I, I need to jump off for a two o'clock call so I, I will uh, leave you here but wanted to thank you all for putting this together. It's terrific. Great. Thanks David. Thanks for coming. Bye, Linda. <laughs> Jay, did you have any other questions for Hannah while she's here? Oh, it's just, I, it was great for me. I was just listening and learning. So, yeah. thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Hannah. So